Hi, fifth graders, Mrs. Reeve here. So today we're going to be talking about the power of words. Now, if you have ever read a book that has made you laugh or cry or just get mad about something, then you know about the power of words. Words have the power to inform and persuade, to make connections, to change attitudes, to inspire action. And so uh, with, um, let me go ahead and start off with this quote. Whatever words we utter should be chosen with care, for people will hear them and be influenced by them for good or ill. And so uh, I want to talk about the power of words through letters, speeches, and poetry. Of course, there are other, a lot of other forms. I mean, you have books and you have journals and all kinds of things, but these are the three that I want to focus on, starting with letters. So sometimes someone wants to make a point and and get some action taken. And so they will write a letter to an editor, like a publication of a newspaper or a magazine or even a community bulletin, or they will send somebody a letter uh, to someone who has influence, maybe a principal or a teacher, parent, or an elected official, somebody who has a little bit more power to make bills and chain, make kind of action happen. And so um, I wanna talk about how to write a letter a persuasive letter because you have something that's on your heart that's kind of pulling on your heartstrings and you want to have other people see things the way you do. So a couple of things to, to think about. And these, um, these little tips here are just tips. They're not like you have to do this, but they're things that you might consider. And when I say, when I say letters, this doesn't mean that something has to be put, on, put in the mail, put a stamp on it, mail it. You can email something. There's different ways to get these letters to people. So how to write a persuasive letter. One, you should keep it short, one page. You know how if you ever go and do a Google search, they say that usually people don't go to the second page. They're just looking at that first page and then if they can't, don't see what they want there, they put in a new search term. So you don't want somebody to get your letter and go, okay, I, you know, this is just so long, I don't have time for this. And make one point and state the point clearly. If you start rambling on, people are going to lose interest. It's like lose the point of the letter. Three, make your letter timely. Tie the issue to a recent event. You know, make it make it where they're making some connections with something that's going on that's a problem, a real problem right now. And four, make sure that you have an action item. What should they do? I mean, you hate to give them a letter and they read it and go, well, that's very interesting. What am I supposed to do about it? So always keep in the back of your mind, what is the issue and what are you trying to inspire? So I have an example of a letter that was written to an editor from an eighth grader. This was written by Finley. And so let me read this to you and you see, keep in the back of your mind, what is the issue? Why is he writing this? And uh, what is he trying to inspire? So listen as I read. Littering is illegal and should be more strongly regulated. We see litter everywhere, wrappers thrown on the ground, bottles, cans, and more. Littering is against the law and supposedly enforced. Studies suggest that there are roughly 5.12 billion pieces of litter on roadways across the nation. This means that there are 6,729 pieces of litter per mile of roadway. 75% of Americans admit to, uh, to littering in the last five years. In the United States, the fine for littering can be anywhere from $50 to $2,500 for the first offense. In the state of Virginia, littering is punishable up to 12 months in prison. Laws were set to prevent littering, but they are clearly not being enforced strongly enough. People continue to do this, yet there seems, seem to be no consequences given. Government authorities should be held responsible for enforcing these laws and be more efficient in doing so. So what is the issue? I mean, are they hoping to get more trash cans around so that people can easily throw away things? Are they trying to make more laws? No, they make it very clear. Let's look at this. In the first line here, littering is illegal and should be more strongly regulated. Boom, you see that right away. And then uh, over here in red, laws were set to prevent littering, but they are clearly not being enforced strongly enough. So what does, what does Finley, Finley want uh, this person to do? And I think that it, this is not their parent. We can assume that it's not their teacher, that it's, but it's somebody who can make a difference and somebody who can enforce laws. Because he's saying at the end 
government authorities should be held responsible for enforcing these laws and be more efficient in doing so. And you notice he's not just giving opinion. He has some facts in here. It looks like he's done some research. He's made it so that um, maybe doing some math and dividing things, it looks like this is something that he added just so that he can create a picture of what this really looks like and enforce uh, strongly enough what he's what the problem is. All right, now let's move on to speeches. And so you can see I have selected two speeches here that are pretty well known. And so uh, I think it's very interesting that they're 100 years apart, 1863 and 1963. But with these speeches and with any speech, do you think that somebody just gets up and starts speaking from the heart? You know, they're so passionate about something and they really want to share. So I could just stand up in front of an audience. No, that is so rare. I don't know of anybody who has done that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that anybody who gets up in front of a crowd of any sort has written things down, has practiced, has, you know, gone back through and edited, changed up things, asked their friends, what do you think about this? And then um, until they get it just perfect. And so these examples, I'm not going to play the whole thing. Let me just play just the tiniest bit so we can be reminded about the issue. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So both of these speeches are, are trying to inspire, you know, the same thing with the, with people giving equality and uh, making sure that everybody is treated equally. But when they were speaking, did you notice they weren't like rushing through as fast as they can? They were looking up. You know, you have to think about the whole thing with speeches, not just what you're saying, but the pace and uh, and and more more than just just the words, but how you're presenting it. Don't rush through those words, though each word is important and is said, uh, is chosen very carefully. And so you want them to be impactful. If you rush through it just as fast as you can, you're going to lose some of that impact. All right. And um, this here is more of a current uh, speech. And so I just picked this, as, this little video is like three or four minutes long. And I want you to think about how he presents what he wants to change. Is he getting angry? Is he sh uh, sharing facts? Is he sharing opinions? What is he doing to convince people to be swayed to way, the way he is thinking, to, to know that what the problem is? About a year ago, I asked myself a question. Knowing what I know, why am I not a vegetarian? After all, I'm one of the green guys. I grew up with hippie parents in a log cabin. I started a site called Tree Hugger. I care about this stuff. I knew that eating a mere hamburger a day could increase my risk of dying by a third. Cruelty? I knew that the 10 billion animals we raise each year for meat are raised in factory farm conditions that we hypocritically wouldn't even consider for our own cats dogs, and other pets. Environmentally, meat amazingly causes more emissions than all of transportation combined. Cars, trains, planes, buses, boats, all of it. And beef production uses a hundred times the water that most vegetables do. I also knew that I'm not alone. We as a society are eating twice as much meat as we did in the 50s. So what was once the special little side treat now is the main and much more regular. So really, any of these angles should have been enough to convince me to go vegetarian. But there I was, tucking into a big old steak. So why was I stalling? 
I realized that what I was being pitched was a binary solution. It was either you're a meat eater or you're a vegetarian. And I guess I just wasn't quite ready. Imagine your last hamburger. So my common sense, my good intentions, whoops, <coughs> were in conflict with my taste buds. And I'd commit to doing it later. And not surprisingly, later never came. Sound familiar? So I wondered, might there be a third solution? And I thought about it, and I came up with one. And I've been doing it for the last year, and it's great. It's called Weekday Veg. The name says it all. Nothing on the face, Monday to Friday. On the weekend, your choice. Simple. If you want to take it to the next level, remember that the major culprits in terms of environmental damage and health are red and processed meats. So you want to swap those out with some good sustainably harvested fish. It's structured, so it ends up being simple to remember. And it's okay to break it here and there. After all, cutting five days a week is cutting 70% of your meat intake. The program has been great, weekday veg. My footprint's smaller. I'm lessening pollution. I feel better about the animals. I'm even saving money. Best of all, I'm healthier. I know that I'm gonna live longer. And I've even lost a little weight. So please, ask yourselves, for your health, for your pocketbook, for the environment, for the animals, what's stopping you from giving weekday veg a shot? After all, if all of us ate half as much meat, it would be like half of us were vegetarians. Thank you. So what was Graham Hill trying to inspire? Was that an obvious thing that he wants people to eat less meat and become a vegetarian just every now and then? Um, did he just give his opinion about things? No, he had a lot of research. He did it a lot to put out some facts in there so people can make up their own minds. I mean, this is something that he's passionate about, but he's not like angry and in your face about this. It's just he's letting you know the facts and presenting it in such a way that you're, you might be inspired to join what he considers a very important cause. Now let's think about poetry. We know that poetry has um, a, a power all in its own. I mean, we had at the uh, presidential inauguration, Amanda Gorman, with the hill we climb. And so let's look at an example of a, of a short poem that somebody wrote that was to um, help people understand an issue and maybe um, inspire them to do something about it. So this one is written by James Rack and it's posted on hellopoetry.com. And this one is called The Bully. Let's see if we can figure out what is the issue and maybe what the person is trying to inspire as well. I am a bully. I tease and taunt. I am relentless. I tell him he is stupid. He is small. He is insignificant. He is too short, too out of shape, too dumb, going to fail. He is in shape. I tell him he's ugly. He has a goal. I tell him he will fail. He wants love. I tell him he is alone. Why? I do not know. However, I bully him. I will continue to bully him because I am scared. I am scared of myself, my failures, my insecurities. Why should he be happy when I am not? So I bully him. I tell him who he is and he is me. Very interesting poem. It makes you think, you know, you could take this a couple different ways. Is he, is he talking about somebody else that's like him? Is he talking about himself that he's just you know, way too hard on himself. You know how people can just get down on themselves and say, I'm not smart enough. I'm not this, I'm not that. That's a very common thing. It's very, uh, very, very common, in fact. And so maybe he is talking to himself, but what is he trying to inspire? I mean, the issue is bullying. It's right there in the title, but is he trying to inspire maybe a little bit more forgiveness, uh, understanding the issue? So you can take you take, take 
poetry just in a lot of different ways. All right, just a little few things to end on. This cute little cartoon, these little faces are so funny. He, the first one says, it was, ah, words can't describe. And he's like, are you sure? That's what words do. If you take care when you're writing your exhibition notes down, when you're taking care, you can choose your words carefully. See if they can make an impact for you. And last, we navigate our whole lives using words. Change and improve the words and I believe we can change and improve life. This is a quote by Martin Farrell, Farrell, an artist. And so isn't that what we're trying to do with our exhibition projects? We're trying to pick something that pulls at our heartstrings that we just think maybe we can make an impact with uh, informing people, persuading them, connect, making some connections and changing their attitudes. And so um, we really want to try to inspire people to action, either by changing their attitude, uh, doing something different. And so you want to make that clear. So make the power of words work for you.